may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be always acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. Amen. Amen. Jim and I were not here last Sunday. We attended the main service at a Unitarian Universalist church in Charlotte where our newest grandchild was being blessed and named. Now Unitarians are a little different from Episcopalians and I went with a preconceived notion of what was going to happen even though I had never been to a Unitarian service. I did not expect to see anything that looked like baptism since I was very carefully told that that was not going to happen. I do know that this is a very loving and accepting congregation and that my daughter-in-law, who has been damaged by her parents' form of fundamentalist Christianity, feels at home there. In fact, her family did not come to the service last Sunday because they believe Unitarians are of the devil. My family, our oldest son and one of his daughters from Boston, my sister and mother from Columbia, and her daughter and fiance from Greensboro were there to represent the Reds. And the service was lovely and gentle and caring and surprisingly did include water. Now I have baptism as my image of what you do to welcome a baby into the community. And water is totally part of baptism. The Unitarians, however, used a rosebud that they dipped in a basin of water, which had been poured out with words about the importance of water for life. And then the woman, who is the pastor, took turns with the rosebud, touching my granddaughter Sadie's forehead, her eyes and ears and chin, her hands and feet and heart, each time saying words asking that she be open to the love and beauty around her and to the peace and caring of the world. It was very nice. She wore an 1883 christening gown, which had been given to my family many years ago by two elderly women from my home parish in Alabama because they were the last of their family and they wanted a family to continue using it. And it was the gown her own father had worn at his baptism. Was she baptized? No. But she was named and she was truly welcomed into the community of both that congregation and the world. Now baptism, as Episcopalians see it, also welcomes people into our community. And the season of Lent is a very traditional time when in the ancient church, this was when new converts to the faith were prepared for baptism, and those who, because of notorious sins, had been separated from the church, were worked to be reconciled and restored to the faithful. The modern church also helps prepare those who wish to be baptized into the fellowship as part of our Easter celebration. We are reminded of this tradition during the opening prayers on Ash Wednesday as we begin Lent and we hear about the place of fasting and study and prayer for preparing for the baptism that is offered at the Great Vigil. The readings throughout the season of Lent are baptism themed because of this tradition of preparation and they therefore offered me this opportunity to look at baptism a little more closely. During the first week, our gospel told us of Jesus in the wilderness and being tempted by the devil after his own baptism. That's how we began Lent. Jesus says no to the temptations and we are reminded in that first week of our baptism's promises to renounce Satan and the forces of wickedness to renounce the evil powers of the world, and to renounce the sinful desires that draw us from God's love. Like Jesus, at our own baptisms, we are reminded to say no to those things that take our focus away from our relationship with God. Then last week we heard the story of Nicodemus and Jesus talking about the importance of being born again. We must be converted we must stop putting our trust in ourselves and in the world, and we should turn to Jesus and accept him as our Savior. 
We are asked if we put our trust in God, Christ's love and grace, and we promise to follow Jesus and obey him as Lord. Then we are reborn as a new person in Christ. And now we have today's readings, which bring to us the main ingredient of baptism, the water. The Old Testament is the story of Moses finding water in the desert for the Israelites. And we are reminded of the importance of water in our lives for thirst and many other needs. And in the gospel, Jesus promises the Samaritan woman living water. Water that will gush within her soul and from which she will never thirst again. And in our baptism service, we come to the point where the priest blesses the water and asks God to sanctify it, that those who are cleansed here from sin and born again may continue in the risen life of Christ. Water gives life to our earth. Did you all know that yesterday was National Water Day? I didn't until I heard it on the news this morning. Recently, Sean and I were preparing for the Lenten Supper on the Ministry of Outreach, and he asked me what areas of outreach that I was passionate about. I thought about it for about a minute, and then I realized that it was clean water. I will always find a way to support clean water needs around the world. We've all heard stories of people who do not have access to clean water, drinking water at all, or who walk great distances to get the water that they need for their families. We certainly take water for granted here. This winter we have heard a lot about lack of water because of the drought out west and the consequences that that will have on all of us with our food budgets. And Jim for many years worked on the Ohio River and I think of water, I think of flood season and all that water coming unchecked down the river with trees and debris floating in it. That is fixed firmly in my mind. I remember too the images of too much water when tsunamis washed over Japan and Indonesia or when a hurricane like Katrina comes ashore and how devastating too much water at any one time can also be. <laughs> in our story this week, we hear about a woman who comes to the well at an unusual time of day. It's noon when it is already hot. She probably comes then because she's not accepted by the other women of her village. And we later learn that she's been married five times and is currently living with a man who's not her husband, which would help to explain why she comes when others don't. Jesus seems to be waiting for her. Again, unusual, since Jews and Samaritans did not talk to each other. He asks her for a drink. And they have an extended conversation, again, unusual, because men and women who were not members of the same family rarely talked to each other. Jesus tells her that he is the Messiah, and he offers her living water, the living water of eternal life that comes from believing in him and in the God that has sent him. Because of their conversation, she believes and Jesus stays in town, and many others come to believe in the Christ. For us, we have the waters of baptism, which provide a place for us to wash away our own sins and to renew our commitment to being Christ's heart and hands here in this community and in the world. We here at St. Mark's have the font right in front of us every Sunday. The altar guild keeps water in the basin of that font, and many of us dip our fingers in it on our way to communion each week. I would invite you today to touch that water in the font as a way on your way to the communion rail to help you remember, to remember the living water that flows within you and is part of your life, to remember who you are and whose you are, that you belong to God and you always have and you always will. I know that I will touch the water in the font. I will use that small dip of water to remember that I am a baptized member of the body of Christ. And because of that, I am marked as Christ's own forever through that baptism. 
It helps me to focus on why I come forward to be fed and nourished by Christ's body so that I can then go out into the world and represent this parish family and this church just like we represented our family last Sunday at the Unitarian Church as we welcomed a new child into God's family. For that event last week and for all the baptized children everywhere, I say thanks be to God. Amen.